Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Marie Charlesworth, and I'm the director at the Franklin County Regional Chamber. I'm really glad that many of you are here this morning. I know how busy we all are, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to join us for a couple of hours. This conversation is an important one, and it's been happening ever since I've been with the Chamber of Commerce. I'm incredibly grateful that Betsy and her team, excuse me, thank you. I'm incredibly grateful that Betsy and her team have taken the time to come to Franklin County to gain some insight in the situation that exists here. I encourage all of you to be vocal and to give your honest thoughts on this topic so that Betsy and her team have a robust agenda to bring back to Montpelier. I'd like to thank my partners in collaboration on this workshop, Tim Smith at Franklin County Industrial Development Corporation, Marty Manahan and the City of St. Albans, and Kathy Lavoy of the Franklin Grand Isle Workforce Investment Board. I'd also like to thank Kathy for generously underwriting um, our sumptuous breakfast this morning. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, and also a quick nod to Hannah who, and the Traveled Cup who've provided breakfast for us this morning and also a welcome to Hannah even though she's not here. She's our newest member of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and now I'd like to turn this over to Betsy, the director of the Vermont Chamber. Thank you, Betsy. So can you all hear me? That's no. like, who said that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen this on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> Oh good, you have. It's the best skit ever if you have it. I promise not to do that today. So thank you for having me. Lisa Marie, thank you for putting this together. And Tim and Kathy, really appreciate this. Um, every year, the Vermont Chamber goes around the state to talk about our legislative agenda. We have a four-person lobbying team that is at the State House every year working on business issues. At the core of what we do, we represent businesses. We're trying to help the economy grow in Vermont. But along the way, we kept hearing that the workforce and the lack of workforce was the biggest problem. And so we sort of changed this conversation a little bit so it's less legislative and more solution oriented. And really trying to figure out how do we start to close that gap that we have with, um, with the workforce supply. So today, what we're going to do, you play a really large role in today's, um, we've got from now until 10 o'clock. So uh, if you thought that you were coming here to listen and take notes, this is the wrong place. You're coming here to listen, take notes, and engage. So you will have a speaking role and a questioning role and we'll be trying to capture all of that. So what I'd like to do today is um, I'm going to start out with a little bit of information to frame the conversation. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is call your attention to, you should all have this wrap card on your tables. If you don't have enough, we have more here, so just raise your hand. Um, Ashley Romeo Bowles is with me at the Vermont Chamber and she's helping today as well. So if you, there's not enough, just let us know and we'll get one out to you. Um, the Vermont Futures Project has engaged in a conversation about how to create a robust economic future for, by 2040. So really long-term economic growth plan. And they've really been looking at sort of six key areas. And those six key areas are on the back they involve economic activity, uh, innovation, um, workforce and talent, which we're going to talk about today, our demographics, uh, quality of place, including housing and infrastructure. But when we started looking at this data, we started looking at how many people are in the workforce today and the declining numbers of the workforce po population. So what this graphic represents is how many people are coming into the workforce on a, on a regular basis and how many people we actually need in the workforce. So we've got about 8,000 in the supply and we've got almost 19,000 people that uh, we need, leaving this nearly 11,000 person gap. That is not a one-time number. That is an annual number. We need 10,000 more people a year every year to keep up with the rate of growth that we have today. That's an astonishing number when you think about it, okay? 
And if you think about some of our population trends and our workforce particip participation rates, we are not moving in the right direction. So this is a target number. This is a, for us to be thinking about how do we get to this rate of growth, population growth, mostly workforce population growth, over the next 20 years. So I can guarantee you that today we are not going to be asking you for a solution to bring 10,000 people here in the next year. That's not today's activity. I don't know how to do that. I don't know what you could imagine that could do that. That's not the plan. The plan is how do we get started so that over time, when we arrive at 2040, we are bringing this many new workers into the economy at this pace. So that's what we're asking you to help us do today. Um, I'm going to ask Ashley to talk a little bit about some more data. You're going to have to speak up because the room is, I can see people are straining to hear. So just, just so you know. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. So the first slide is our workforce participation rates. The blue line is the United States and the yellowish green line is Vermont. Um, traditionally, we had followed along the national average relatively well, but in the last several years, while they've seen an uptick in their workforce participation rates, we've actually continued our decline. This reason is because, of course, we have an aging population in the state, and so we originally had individuals who had deferred retirement because of the recession, and now that we're getting out of it, those people that had worked later in life are now deciding that they're starting to settle down and go towards retirement. So originally we had the age 65 to 74 uh, age group. About 30% of those individuals were in the workforce in Vermont. And in the United States, the average is about 25%. So we have a much older working population and we also don't have a net in migration of young individuals that are moving into the workforce. So our net in migration of individuals tends to favor the older cohorts which aren't looking to get into the workforce. So we have an aging population and we have a declining workforce. So that is a struggle for us. Currently we have a little more than about half of our population in the workforce. We have about 625, 626,000 people in the state. And we have about 344,000 people in our workforce. Again, that's a problem because we're not losing the number of jobs. Our number of jobs have been steady. In fact, we're looking to increase the number of jobs as we fuel the economy. We're struggling to do that because we don't have individuals that can move into the workforce. We have as of September, a 2.9% unemployment rate, which sounds really great. It's the lowest it's been in 17 years. But that's a struggle because we, our employers can't find the workers to fill those jobs. We just don't have the individuals. And we don't have people moving into the state. So the biggest problem that we've been hearing is we just can't find workers. Whether they're skilled workers, unskilled workers, we just can't find people moving in. And the reason for that is because we, again, don't have young people that are wanting to move into the state necessarily. We, in the West Coast, there are a lot of in-migration of populations. They've got thousands and thousands of people moving in each and every year. While Vermont has a wide number of people moving in, we also have a large number of people moving out. So our net gain between 2010 and 2015 was about plus 297 people. So that's a big struggle. Again, you know, in five years' time, we've gained 300 people. So that's the big concern. And the drivers of our population change, again, is we've got an aging workforce. People are moving out of the workforce. And then we don't have the immigration, and we don't have the natural population growth. Vermont has the lowest birth rate in the country right now. Uh, people are just choosing to have children later in life or not have children at all. And so at this point, we have just transitioned from having more births in our state, having more births than deaths. Now we've reached a point where we're having more deaths in the state than we are births per year. So our natural population just within our state, not having any migration, we're losing people each and every day, and we're not gaining that back. And then we have the double conundrum of people aren't coming into the state and choosing to stay and live here 
for an extended period of time. So that's definitely, we, we would like to see these lines flipped. We'd like to see a much greater immigration population, a much greater natural population increase. So that is why we're here today, because we are facing this problem, and it's not something that's coming down the line. It's something that we are facing currently. And when our employers are struggling to find workers, they're turning to other alternatives to replace workers whether that be cutting store hours or trying to come up with technology that replaces us. I mean, it's amazing the number of fast food restaurants that are looking at kiosks or having robots come in and do the hamburger flipping because they just can't find people to fill those positions. So in ways, we're setting ourselves up for disaster by encouraging all these employers to find ways to replace us. So we need to work on this trend immediately. So that's why we are asking everyone here to sort of help develop ideas as to how do we bring people into this state and how do we get them here to stay. So thank you. Um, that's a little bit of data to get us started. Um, and one of the things that you should know is that there are a lot of people working on this, right? We hear about this all over. I think Kathy Lavoy has certainly uh, been working on this from a number of different ways, mostly in your day job, but also um, there's a project going on called the Vermont Talent Pipeline Management System, and she's been integrally involved in that. Kathy, do you want to give a, a point of information? You want to give a two-minute overview of, of that project, or, or three-minute, or what, yeah, whatever no, you need? Um, yeah. So the Vermont Talent, Talent Pipeline Management and we have a five-member team here in Vermont that's working on this. And the chamber, Vermont Chamber is looking at the, uh, the, the gap in the numbers. And Vermont Talent Pipeline Management is looking at the gap in the skills. So it's a, a supply chain I'd love you to answer the question, which, why Vermont? Um, we created a business collaborative, our first one being construction. And they um, do a needs assessment. What are their needs of uh, retiring people and new people that they will need? We then collaborate with the education world and we do a talent flow analysis. So we look back into the new employees coming into a business and we look where they came from, what their best skill sets are, and what place that they came from um, gives them the, the greatest success so that that onboarding time is less for a new employee. So um, it's a very um, complicated um, process. There is a web tool, construction um, conversations are happening right now and have already seen some changes in the curriculum that will be delivered hopefully here in our in our technical centers first um, in the construction program. So again, uh, uh, Vermont Chamber and Vermont TPM are on the same road, traveling in the same direction. We're just identifying those two different needs so that we can build the skill sets up. Thank you. And I think it's worthy to note that I probably, if I asked everybody here, they would be able to find an initiative on the workforce that they are familiar with, one of the reasons that you're here. Um, and what, what the Futures Project is trying to do is suggest that there's many problems that we need to fix, and there's not one solution. So while we're looking at finding new people to come into Vermont to help us grow our economy, we at the same time <laughs> need to take the people who are here and help build their skill sets. And we have a lot of programming for that now in Vermont. We have several uh, training programs that are funded by the state of Vermont. They're uh, in different regions. The talent pipeline program that Kathy is talking about is addressing the skills gap. So all of these things have to happen, right? So we're going to now get into sort of the solution phase and start to think about how do we get more people to Vermont. And inevitably in this conversation, I think this is the seventh one we've done, we've been going around, uh, around the state in different counties and doing this. Inevitably we talk about things that we need to do for the current population. We will not ignore those things, we're adding to that, and this is the kind of thing that, what do we have to do today, and what do we have to do for the future. Um, before we do that, I'm gonna give you one more point of information. That's blinding. Um, How'd we do? Great. So we all asked you, did you? Yeah, see? No exceptions. Um, we asked everybody to do 
a little bit of an exercise before they came in and answer the question, why Vermont? We're purposefully vague uh, because it means something different to everybody. The point of this exercise is really to understand why are you all here? Why do you stay? Sometimes people um, use it for a lot of different reasons. We, again, are doing this all around the state and we are tracking all of this information to see if there are similarities in each region. Because we all are very unique. You know, Franklin County, St. Albans, what you do here is you feel is very unique, different than the Mad River Valley or Brattleboro. And in many ways it is, but in many ways we're the same. And as the statewide Chamber of Commerce, we're trying to figure out with 625,000 people, how do we move that dial for that community? So we're going to talk a little bit about the groupings. Ashley has rearranged these. And I'm going to point out something about this particular gathering today. I noticed when you all put your sticky notes up here, it was all in very specific rows and columns. We've never, <laughs> seen, we've never seen that anywhere else. Usually it's this like smattering. So I don't know what that says about all of you. Um, usually when we have to redo these, we are the ones who are organizing them. But you put them all in lines and rows. So I'm guessing you all love sort of Excel spreadsheets or something. So anyway, so that's great. So. Um, I don't see gatherings, <laughs> actually. <laughs> okay. So, and then quality of life. Okay. So, what we've done is we've we've really we've really sort of focused all of these in various ways. The first time we did this, we did this at our um, business expo at the Sheridan in the spring. We had like a thousand business people that come to it, and we had this huge wall people could write on the wall. It's a business event. The people who are come are are in business. We anticipated the answers to be something like, I love my job, or I'm, I invented something, or my business is thriving, or even, even a negative thing maybe, like, ooh. We got zero business comments on that huge wall for that whole day. And so we decided to take this out to the regions and find out, <coughs> as we hold chamber meetings, is that true? And looking at yours, it kind of is true. So this area here, we've rearranged them. These two columns are sort of the quality of life, the reason that you're here. So school at first, stayed for the green, friendships and love. The people, the landscape, shared values and community, clean living, uh, born and raised, I'm going to put that up there for a second, care about each other, presence of real communities, Four seasons, schools, safety, up, 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 work availability. There's, there's, there's one. Somebody hear that word? It's interesting. Okay. Um, Vermont is home, quality of life, uh, small population, one person can make a difference. We hear that a lot. The state's economic development marketing plan talks about how much a difference a state can make. Great place to live, small scale communities, quality of life. Um, Vermonters are willing to embrace and lead, change, and innovate. So this is sort of the quality of life, and the reason I pulled this one out and this one is these are common themes that we hear. I was born and raised here, and I stayed. Can you still hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, okay. It'll, it'll be done quick then. Okay, great. Um, and the other one is I went to school and stayed. We want to hear more of this, I went to school and stayed, right? So if you look at this card, you'll see that we have about 4,500 college graduates that are staying. That number is about half of the college graduates that we graduate every year. So there's room for improvement, right? It's unlikely we'll ever get to 100%. It's hard to get to 100% of anything. So even if you got another 2,000, you still haven't addressed the gap. So we have to do more than keep our youth here. So I think those things are interesting. The middle uh, area here is a little, still a little bit more about quality of life, but more about beauty. So it's a beautiful state, beauty of the state, anything you could want to do in the outdoors, the nature, uh, community. It's the most beautiful state. It's beautiful, beauty and health, great natural environment, beautiful quality of li uh, life, living four seasons. So a lot of beauty, a lot of community and quality of life, 
Again, so far I'm only up to one that even has remotely anything about work, which is work availability. Thank you. <laughs> I did not prime Representative Keenan before we came. <laughs> um, that's your life in Montpelier, I appreciate it, good. Um, and then these are some, some things that don't fit necessarily anywhere uh, on this page, but family, this is another reason. It's sort of back to the born and raised. You usually have family, your roots are here, that's good. Uh, uh, ding! Mm -hmm. Vermont is a great place to work, shop, live, and play. So there's two. We, that's the most we've seen in any region. Wow. We have seen one. But we've, I don't think we've ever seen two. Oh, good. She's read them all. She had to reorganize them for me. Uh, because of our talent and innovation. Three, Franklin County's getting an award. Um, oh, gosh. Excellent life, excellent er, um, area for work-life balance. Uh, great education, schools and colleges, which is good. And I would put sort of part of this. And close-knit business community. So this is kind of interesting. We've not seen that kind of grouping before. So that's great for us, us to hear. And the reason we go through this exercise along with this data is what we're trying to get you to sort of think about is this is very consistent with the trends that we hear. I was born and raised here. I have family here. I stay for the community. I love the people, the beauty, the outdoor recreation, the nature. Often it's not because I moved here for a really awesome, good paying job. We rarely hear that, okay? So when we are trying to solve this problem, we need to keep in mind why so many of us are already here and stay here. What is our reason for why Vermont? And thinking about that. So that's about where the speaking part ends and when, where your part starts. Before I move forward, any questions or observations or thought on the sticky note, the post-it note exercise? Is it surprising to anybody? Do you know in your communities, in your, in your friend's circle, do you hear something different than that? Yeah. This Saturday I attended a conference at UVM on the what surprised me is the number of women that feel excluded from the workforce, one, because of sexual discrimination and harassment, and two, because of child care. Interesting. I think we have the population and the talent if, you, if we come to grips with those two issues. Good. So we're going to get started right away then. So, so one of the things, one of, um, the things that Ashley's going to try to write up is I would categorize that not as a solution, but as an obstacle to our success. So we're going to start a post-it sheet of things that we need to fix. <laughs> that list can get very long, because in Vermont, we're very good at problem identification. Okay? We're very good at that. We're also very good at idea generation. Okay? And in my world, problem identification and idea generation go hand in hand. Those tend to be easy things to do. The really hard work is we've identified the problem, we've even created the solution, but actually getting it done is really, really hard. And what we're trying to do is find those solutions throughout the state so they're not one-offs, so that there is um, community support throughout our community, which is the state of Vermont, not just one region. We can't just fix one region, we've got to fix the whole state. So. Um, one of the areas that we'd like to see, um, yes, go ahead. No, just relative to the exercise. Yes. It would have been great to see two or three out there that said, because of lower taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so that would have been pretty great. <laughs> so let's talk about that, though. Because let's talk about that. Yes. Have you, so nobody here admitted to, I don't, put it on their sticky note, that they moved here for tax rates or, or have moved to someplace else or moved away from someplace else for tax rates, right? So that's a, it's an interesting question because from the business community, I lobby on a regular basis 
not to have our taxes increase. I am not ashamed of that whatsoever. That's what my businesses ask me to do. Um, but I'm not sure when we're trying to attract people, I don't hear people <coughs> saying that is a motivator for moving to someplace. So let me ask you this. How do we motivate people who are 25 to 64 years old? That's our target market. Why? I'm not being age discriminating. That's, who's the, that's the workforce population. That's the problem we're trying to fix. If they come with people under 25 or over 64, we'll take them too. <laughs> but I'm trying to fix the workforce problem. How do we motivate that target population to think about living and working in Vermont? Thoughts? Yeah. You're going to create different boards. Whatever. But I think that that gap of people that have tried to make it are love being here, and ultimately, indeed, because they're not able to financially afford. So I think these are two sides of, of a similar uh, issue. So I sort of talk about that as cost of living, affordability, we often hear it called. Um, is that a tax issue, <laughs> or is it sort of uh, all the costs, right? So, so um, it's extra income issue, to afford everything. So, right. So, uh, so cost of living as well as I would put um, just because you put a wage wage levels as well, which is part of that. So you can bring down the cost of living, or you can bring up the wage levels, or you could do both right. and and get to even a better net. Right? Okay. Good. Yeah. They feel like the quality of life for raising a family in Vermont is something that draws them. So right. I think we have an opportunity there to attract a lot more younger families who don't want to live in Boston because it's yep. crazy and they sit in traffic. And, okay. You know, but you are talking exactly about this post-it note exercise. Yeah. Okay. This is quality of life. So let's. T I'm going to ask Ashley to put um, on one of these sort of a target population is young families. Yes? <coughs> Which is different than keeping more youth here. Okay? Those are, to, in my mind, two different things. The 22-year-old that just graduated from college versus, and I don't know, I never know everybody has kids at different ages, but a little bit later, <laughs> a couple years later, you've had your first job maybe, you found a significant other, Maybe you're starting to think about quality of life issues, which we're really primed for, right? So if, I'm going to just go down this a little bit, but if you think of other target markets that we can, we can try to lure here, what do you think we can do for these people to encourage more of those Bostonians doing that rat race? Um, my 24-year-old son lives in D.C. and loves it, is never coming home. Maybe maybe in a few more years, right? But right now, loves the rat race. And when I go visit him, I just see endless amounts of people dragging around their children. They look bedraggled, and I'm like, boy, there's another way, right? So how do we get to them? What do we tell them? How do, what can we do to help solve that problem? Yeah. sort of another subcategory, yeah. So tourists, good. We'll talk about them in a bit. Yes, and then yes. Uh, forming a uh, committee of all the alumni uh, yep. personnel at the different universities, because they've had everybody come through. Yep. Why not reach out to them? To so alumni, them? yep. College alumni, that's great. And, and high school alumni. And high school. So it's interesting. I'm just going to give you a little factoid on that, and then we're going to go to you. And then, <laughs> um, when we did this data collection, we found out, shockingly, that no one actually collects this data. These numbers are what I would call a best guess estimate 
from talking to everybody who collects some amount of data and they feel comfortable with it. We talk to the state college system, we talk to the Department of Labor, we talk to the Agency of Education, but nobody knows how many kids graduate from college, they know that number, and stay. In this day and age, there should be a way to do that, no? So we found that to be, be fascinating. Cindy, you had something you wanted to? To attract, That's right. so, so she has said we need to keep the environment clean because of our quality of life issues. Great. Yep. I think if there were educational incentives for uh, college, uh, families might be attracted to stay yep. here. Any further ideas on that? Do you have anything that works better than something else? I mean, there's a lot of ideas out there. Yeah, like Bernie's plan. Yep. <laughs> Which is, so, so, but Bernie's plan is free, educa free college education. So, the, I'm just going to talk about that a bit. So free college education gets the 18 to 22 year old to come to college here. And the good thing about that with this exercise is once you've spent four years in Vermont, we got a fighting chance of keeping you, right? But then again, only 50% through the data stay. So that's one idea on the college piece. Uh, just leave some gaps here because my guess is we're going to have some more ideas around, around this area so that we can couple them together. I yeah. So I think if you had college incentive, um, you, could, uh, you could build in some obligations to work to stay. Yeah. So um, in 2005, our legislature wrestled with that. Uh, it was called Promise Scholars to do just that. You remember that. It was rejected by the legislature. Um, then Governor Douglas had promoted that <coughs> plan uh, to do exactly that. I remember that because I worked on that plan. <laughs> so I remember what year it was and I remember the rejection hard. But we're back at it now and it's a good idea. It's still a good idea to be able to have that kind of thing and, and attach some sort of work requirement or something. Um, I just want to make sure I go in order. Uh, you've already spoken, so yeah, go ahead. And do we have those jobs that attract those young families from New York or Washington? Um, and looking where the job growth is in the state, it's not. Do you have my favorite thing? Um, necessarily jobs that people are, are looking for. Ah, but there it is. Do we have the right jobs? And Can I have that? It's a really good question. Um, we're at a place now where we have employers who don't, uh, that are struggling with adding more jobs. Because even with the jobs that they have, they can't fill them. And this is where the skills cap that Kathy Lavoie talked about comes in. So I put a job out on in the interwebs, right? And wherever you put that, and you're not getting the quality candidates you want. I t have employers uh, who have manufacturing jobs, $20 an hour, $17 an hour with benefits. They go to job fairs. They see the same people. They're not, they can't hire them. So we, have, we do have a skills gap currently, which I think is something that Kathy had talked about earlier. Um, but do we have the jobs? We do. Um, I don't know if anybody, ha we, we walk around with like one or two of these. But if you haven't seen this document, um, we can get you one. It's a pretty amazing document uh, done by the McClure Foundation. And um, it talks about the types of jobs that we have in Vermont, what you need to have them. It tells you if you've only got a high school diploma, these are the kind of jobs that you can have. If you get a little bit more training, this is the more jobs you can have. Uh, maybe you've got a college degree, two-year, four-year, whatever. It's really great. And their website is even better because you can drill down into this information. So um, I think we know, the, we know some of those answers. I think what's missing a little bit is um, I had a woman, we did this in uh, the Rutland area, and had a woman walk up to me and say, you clearly don't need more of me because I can't find a job. So what do you need? <laughs> and I'm like, hmm. 
She has four year liberal arts degree and she's working at a, she has a job, but it's not at the wage or skill level that she wants. But she doesn't have a specific skill. So that was her, her problem. So I thought that was an interesting, interesting comment. Externally to make them attractive to actually bring people to Vermont. That's sort of my. So idea. you used a word that we haven't put down yet that I'm going to put down, and that's market. We don't market Vermont as a place to live and work. We just don't. Okay? Our employers are doing it through their HR departments in a variety of different ways. Um, but when you, how many of you travel out of state yourselves on a regular basis, right? Everybody. You talk to your family and all that. What are we known for in Vermont? So, so beer. I'll just let you know, it's not unusual for us to have a sticky note that says beer. I just, I just let you know, it's actually getting to be a category all of its own, so, which is great. So beer, cheese, food, quality of life, skiing, environment, this is what people know us for, right? Good, we love that. Do any of these people that you talk to that live out of state ever go, you've got a really neat tech sector going on. God, your food manufacturing is amazing. I didn't realize that you guys were like the renewable energy jobs of the future. Does anybody ever say these things to you? No, do you know why? Because we don't tell them. We don't tell them at all. We tell them, we tell them this. So I'm, I'm going to put the word market up there because I think part of all of this is once we identify these, these strategies, we need to tell something, somebody about these things as opposed to just ourselves. You had, a, so you had something you wanted to add to that market? So I think you put a honey chopper camp around factoids about Vermont. So just, <laughs> actually, you, you suggested that before. So, um, so, so one of the, so this is, this is getting to a solution now. So now we've identified the problems, we've identified the target market of young families, all right? We have said we need to market to young families, and now we've even got a way to do that, which is put it on heavy topper cans. Put it on a big Cabot truck. Like, you know, you see those Cabot trucks everywhere. Why don't we work with our business community and ask them to help us market Vermont as a place to live and work. Yes, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm a huge fan and a big proponent of the tourism industry in Vermont. It is a major driver uh, in industry in our state. Okay? We employ 31,000 people in the state in that industry. It's incredible. We cannot damage that on our way to get more people. So we've got to preserve this. We've got to keep our clean environment. We've got to keep our clean water. We've got to keep our good communities. Trust me, adding 10,000 more people is not going to ruin that. That's only 10,000. That's not that much. Yeah? Um, so I think that in terms of the young families, in some way they are having to choose between quality of life and income. So many people that I know that are moving back are taking pay cuts, significant pay cuts. Um, to come back, so I think there's a term for that. Have to have that. I've heard a term that uh, the people who are coming back, they're younger than me, so I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to put a label on them, but the the younger than me people that are coming back call it the Vermont haircut. They actually have a term for it, and they know that it's going to happen. But they've become, they've gotten to the point in their lives that all of these things are higher priority at this point in their lives than maybe getting the exact income that they want. But we're not seeing the growth we want them, though. There are a lot that aren't yep. willing to take the haircut. And, that's, <laughs> so. and so we need to figure, figure that out, which goes back to the wages that we, we had talked about. Good. Yes? I worked at the uh, local hospital that I'm seeing, and one of the things that we do to attract the physicians particular and we're looking at expanding it to nurses because so many of the young people today have a huge amount of college debt mm -hmm. and I can tell you that we would not be able to recruit physicians unless we do a loan forgiveness program with them and it, it's a lot of money 
that attracts them. And that's the, one of the primary reasons why they're coming back to Vermont. A lot of them do have connections, but without the tuition forgiveness, they wouldn't come here. And we're experiencing the same thing with nurses in particular. And if you talk to our employees, they say that the University of Vermont is one of the highest cost yeah. public universities in the country. Yeah. It is. And they're leaving. <laughs> if we're only get, retaining 50% of those college students, I bet other universities are even doing better with retaining people that are graduating from colleges within their state borders. So I think we need to focus on those people. I think we need to offer tuition assistance, loan forgiveness in particular. So that's a little bit, um, so yeah. a lot, put that next to this one. So you had talked about attracting yeah, them, so, so sort of the Bernie plan to get them here. You're talking about loan forgiveness maybe either, are you talking about Vermont no. college graduates or we will forgive your loan if you went to Iowa State if anywhere. you work here for X, okay. So we have a couple of loan forgiveness programs in the state on targeted, um, targeted industries. Enough. And it's not enough, I hear you. So, so we're gonna just start putting money next to all of our solutions, the money sign, because that becomes a big problem. But you know, it's interesting, I am, um, probably more information about me than you need to know, but I watch Squawk Box in the morning. Does anybody else watch Squawk Box? Okay. It's a financial news show on CNBC. And um, so as I'm getting ready in the mornings, I get my financial news that way. And there's somebody advertising for a, a new uh, employer benefit that they can offer to their employees. And I am never with a pad and paper in the morning while this is going on in the background, so I haven't got the company's name. But it is a benefit that you can offer your employees that is college um, uh, tuition, not, it's not loan forgiveness, but it's tuition payments. And I drive around the state doing these with Ashley, who is a fairly recent VLS Vermont Law School grad with plenty of debt. <laughs> so we, we talk about these issues, right? And you know, I think about as an employer, I'm a small employer in Vermont and I'm doing what I can. You know, I have a health care plan that I offer my employees. We pay 75% of the premiums. Um, I have a 401k plan and we match up to 4%. So we have all the PTO and sort of all those other things. But I think about what we offer to try to attract. I've only got 16 employees, so I'm sort of a typical small business in Vermont, right? Like how, do we, how are we, we as an employer able to afford all of that, right? Well, I need to do that to attract. But it started making me think when I watched this commercial for whatever company this is, somebody's out with a product that will line up with my 401k benefits, my health care benefits, and I can attract now to one of my benefits could be to help pay off your loan as long as you're working for me. So right now a lot of employers will do, you know, college credit reimbursement. You can go to college and I'll do that. This is sort of a flip side of that. So it's, it's intriguing. Um, I don't know if we need that company to do it or we can do it on our own. But I think loan forgiveness, that kind of thing is coming up. Yeah. So if you want to reference, <laughs> find out the names yeah. of the companies, you can follow the, uh, the replay of, of Marketplace. So it's interesting. I mean, um, if you offer a 28-year-old the benefit package, do they want the 401k or the health care or the tuition reimbursement? They probably want it all, right? So as a small employer, you've got to figure out what can I afford. But it is an interesting, like I not, I've not thought about that as an employer benefit, as opposed to going to the state and saying we need $100 million for free tuition. Or we need $100 million, and I'm making that number up because I don't have any idea, for loan forgiveness. They were saying that, you know, right here, all the, youth, the younger generation thinks they're gonna stay healthy. Retirement's like way out mm -hmm. there, and that they're much more likely to opt for contribution to paying off their loan. Right. So, can you do that kind of a thing where right now with our four hundred one k, you can if you can put one percent in, we'll match one percent up to four percent. What if you offered that to Ashley? What would you do, Ashley, to put you on the spot? Right. You got to do all of it though. You've got to pay that off, and you've got to do that. So, Kathy, you had a yeah. But and, and all of that is, is great ideas, but we need to uh, track to keep the young adult that may not necessarily have a college 
much debt. Mm -hmm. And um, as Jim and I know, my population for my program um, of Franklin County internships and placements, the population growing 22 to 26. Mm -hmm. And they're coming through the door, they're coming into Jim's office, they're probably coming into Lisa's office and ringing my phone to say, okay, I'm back, now what? Right. And we don't really have, other than, if, unless they know one of us, unless they walk into Jim because they went to the tech center, or they call me because they heard me at school five years earlier, they don't have a place to go. And then once they're there, then there is a need for that handle. Housing is incredible. The cost, where they find it, it's limited, all those things. There needs to be an ushering of them. Now, so, so it, it wasn't needed years ago, fine. It is needed now. It's so you're talking about... It's not because they're not knowledgeable, it's just that the factors that are affecting them are so much greater yep. that they need assistance in finding their way. And we do nothing to help them other than a few pocketed people in each region to do that. So describe this person, high school educated. High school education probably oftentimes has, you know, a great credential like an apprenticeship in electrical and plumbing or something like that. And they just need, to, where are the jobs? Where can I find How do I make that upgrade? next step up? So what's the... What's the solution? What's the ushering? What's I, that? Personally, I believe it's look, it's regional. We work together the best we can, Lisa and Jim and I and a host yep. of other people, and say, okay, you know, how can we help and how can we support? So it's one on one. The system is informal. Yep. And it's because you have dedicated people in the region to make it work who can pick up the phone and call Kathy or call somebody, yep. Tim or somebody. And it needs to be more of a regional effort that okay. is supported. Here comes the word, supported financially with yep. money, with somebody yep. in, a, in a position to be able to Okay, support. great. You and then you. Yep. The supporting of the money, legalize recreational marijuana, use the taxes for that to help fund some of these profit would be projects. So legalizing marijuana as a funding source for that effort and college and all that. So I just I will say that when there's money on the table. When people are talking, legalizing marijuana is one issue. The money is what we're talking about here. I can tell you right now, there are a whole lot of people in that line. Starting with the police departments, law enforcement. Next, in the education systems. Next, in the health systems. You can probably put workforce and college at the end of that line. But the question, question is, how much money does that bring in and can it fund everything everybody wants? Probably not, because it's a long line already. But that's, that's one place to get money for more things that we want. At the end of the day, we have 625,000 people, and we still have jobs that are open, and we don't have people enough to fill them. So, yes? Part of the solution around the money is to use those people who are retired, who have lived and worked in the community, and have network connections already to this <coughs> and government. There's a lot of us yeah. who volunteer our time for multiple issues. It seems to me, with a little bit of money, create a place where us elderly people can call in and say, can I, you use me for yep. mentoring 22, 18 to 22. Do you have a score um, yes. thing up here? And does that work in that function, or is that not working in that way? I think they are in and out of small businesses. They're not sustaining people for finding employment. It's to help small businesses survive. I see. Okay, thank you. Other ideas, other populations. We've talked about young families, attracting young families. We've talked about, we haven't actually talked about them. We've, we've identified tourists as a population, but we haven't talked about what do we do with them? We, we know they're all around us, especially this time of year, right? Ideas for targeting them or encouraging them to live and work here instead of just visit. Yeah. thought about the marketplace in general and where we fit into that. So being able to see you know, statistically um, where wages are here compared to our surrounding states, since we're on an island, kind of mm -hmm. identifying what there are for opportunities. Yep. I think that's good. I think there's some efforts underway to identify that. I heard an interesting uh, tactic the other day. There's a woman that doesn't hold a 
fancy title who works in state government somewhere, buried in state <coughs> government. And uh, she used to work in the tourism department, and she happens now to work in the labor department. And she, every year, our tourism department goes to the Big E. Anybody familiar with the Big E? Okay, good. So hundreds of thousands of people walk through the Vermont building at the Big E, and we give them what? Syrup, cheese, beer, <laughs> magazines, come visit, Jeez. right? Skiing, that's what we give them. And because she loves the Big E, she asked her current employer, which is the Department of Labor now, not the tourism department, but she was very familiar with the Big E from that. She's like, can I go? Because it's like 11 days. Like, she didn't ask to go. I don't know how long she was there for, but literally, this woman is not the commissioner of something. She's not the deputy commissioner of something. She is just a state employer, employee who loves Vermont. She came up with this idea all on her own and just took a piece of paper, colored piece of paper, and she put on it jobs in Vermont, $80,000 engineer St. Albans. And then she put $40,000, you know, manufacturing worker, Rutland. She had like all these different things, just literally copied herself on a piece of paper because she worked at the Department of Labor, so she knew what jobs were open. And she said people were like asking, and I'm like, who is this woman? Let's, <laughs> let's get more of that. There was no marketing program. There was no legislation. There was no group think. She just did it. And it was a fascinating <coughs> eye-opener for those of us who talk about these issues and to think about those tourists. We don't need all of them to come here. We couldn't handle that but just a small percentage of them. So we do a lot of work with our B&B owners in this state, um, especially around Airbnb right now. And uh, that's a whole different issue that we can get into if you'd like, about tax revenue and health regulations and the health of our tourism industry. <laughs> housing availability. <laughs> uh, what is crunching our housing availability? Hmm. Um, but um, what's interesting is that their visitors come, and inevitably when they leave on Sunday night, they say what? I love you people here in Vermont. I had such a great time. It would be so great to live here. Oh, you guys are so lucky. And what does the B&B owner say? She gives them syrup. Gives them syrup and says, so good having you. See you next year. Right? Because they're in the hospitality business. What if? What if? we started talking to them about being ambassadors. So not everybody says that when they leave, so you can just say, see you next year. But even if 10% of our tourists said that, and we had some sort of ambassador program to teach these people to go, where's this thing? We have jobs here. Or that little thing that the woman buried in the Department of Labor did. There's, there's this. I don't know what that program is, but we could do that. So, yeah. You could also do that with the, uh, with the college students. Uh, you know, really market to them. I'm one of the 4,500 about 25 years ago. I, I came to school here and fell in love with the state. I came up in Boston and fell in love and stayed. Yay! Uh, but, <laughs> but I don't know how much marketing happens directly saying these are the jobs that are available here and now to seniors in college. I don't know. Uh, there's, there's a lot of that. It, um, what we hear from college students a lot is, I don't know that there's a job for me here. So some colleges do a really good job at placement. Some employers do a really good job at recruiting college graduates from Vermont. Um, there's lots of different ways to do this, but there's not a um, coordinated effort to um, make sure that the jobs that we have are available and that's why I keep holding this up and love this because this group is trying to get this into our high schools into our tech centers it is, it is. It, it's trying trying to get those kids to be thinking about it more and more so other groups that we should oh yeah go ahead but we should start learning French and we should try to attract young Canadians who live in the Montreal area and want something different are those kids who are entrepreneurial 
and need to be able to come to Vermont for the U.S. market. Yep. It's a great idea. Other thoughts along that line? Yeah. That's the object that the uh, pet conference that we put on in the fairground. Yep. Is the best kept secret that we've got in Vermont. <laughs> thank you. Well, <laughs> thank you that it's a good thing, bad that it's a secret, but okay. Well, I just think of the target area could be enlarged. Yeah. And there are a lot of tech jobs that are open that are very good paying jobs. Yeah. That might be of interest to UVM students, especially if they want to stay up here in the summer. Yeah. So I'll just explain this a little bit. We do a, a, a manufactured in Vermont uh, trade show. Uh, and it really started as a focus on the aviation and aerospace industry. Now back to knowing about syrup and cheese. I'm sure you're all very aware that we have a thriving aerospace and aviation industry in Vermont, right? You didn't know that? I wonder why. We don't tell anybody. Right, I forgot. Um, so <laughs> we actually do have quite a few companies. They're not the big companies generally making a big jet engine. You know, we can't sustain those companies. But they are the manufacturers who are in the supply chain of that. So what we do is we, um, we have started working with our, our, our counterparts in Quebec about 10 years ago. And they have a very big aerospace and aviation sector in, in Quebec, which is much larger than ours. And so we started trying to connect small Vermont manufacturers with large Canadian manufacturers to do that. And we have an MOU with our partners, Aero Montreal, and we've, we've begun to build out that corridor. And now what we're doing is we are bringing these very large out-of-state manufacturers like Boeing, like Bell Helicopter, like Raytheon. We are bringing their supply chain managers to Vermont, and we're pre-qualifying the small Vermont manufacturers, and we're creating face-to-face -face meetings with them. Because before this, if you were a manufacturer in Vermont, like located in Chelsea, Vermont, and you had 45 people working for you at good paying jobs with good benefits, you could call Boeing all day long and they're not taking your call. So we have created a face-to-face -face discussion with pre-qualified candidates. So Boeing comes every year. And uh, they now have 31 suppliers in Vermont because of this effort. Uh, that's pretty good. We'll, we'll take that. So that's the kind of growth that we're working on that, that Representative Keenan is talking about. Um, and what we did last two years ago is we added a workforce component to it, obviously, because what else can we do here? We have all these manufacturers here. So we worked with Vermont Technical College. And uh, the first year, we brought about 10 um, seniors that were getting ready to graduate to talk to these Vermont manufacturers. <coughs> And I know it's really small, but they landed four jobs there at that, that piece. This year, they expanded that. And next year, we're already getting other colleges and universities. Norwich wants to be a part of this. We're trying to get other folks to really bring that next generation of workers to the manufacturing setting and create that, in addition to creating the interface for more business, more contracts leading to more jobs. Um, also thinking about the workforce piece, because employers can't fulfill a contract that they just landed if they don't have the workers to do it. Uh, I'm going to go, yeah, go ahead. Um, there's a funny thing I think we should think about are employers who do not reside in Vermont who are willing to hire remote workers. So there's, right, especially yeah. within my family, my sister went to UVM, graduated in psychology, huge debt load, decided to move to LA, so she landed a, a great recruiting job. And then she wanted to move back to Vermont to be with family, but she went to her employer and said, can I move back to Vermont? And they said yes. And then my other sister, who lives in Danville, works for a company out of New York City, and she would only stay in Danville if she still resides with this company. If she stops working for this company, she said she'll move out of the state. Yep. So they're, they're paying quite a bit of money for these people to move to a beautiful state. So the remote worker um, is, a, in, I think that Vermont is ripe for being the remote worker haven. Uh, there's some marketing guru who can make it sound better than that, okay? I don't know, there's probably some better label than that. But 
What I wonder is if there's something that we can do to help spur that. So that's happening organically. Um, I think it is a target market. So we've identified young families. We've identified the tourist population. Identifying the remote worker who has some, ideally has some sort of ties to Vermont, right? So what kinds of things can we do to, so these people happen to have enough courage to ask their own employer and the roots to do it and it all comes together. Good for them. Is there some other thing that we can do in Vermont to set ourselves up for more success so it's not onesie twosie but it's a thousand people? Because we know they're here. We know all of us can identify people who are doing that. How do we get more of them? Yeah. Interesting. MIT technology right here, that remote workers <clears throat> feel a great deal of isolation if they're working from home. And my thought is, why not create something like incubator, spa incubator spaces for these remote workers so they have a group of colleagues that they can share, talk with, find problems when you're stuck on uh, software, things yep. like that. And tie it, because again, a lot of these now are women going into this field. So it's interesting because uh, there was just an initiative uh, a couple weeks ago announced about co-location co spaces and doing more of that. So that's good. And where's Lisa Murray? There you are, right here. Uh, when you said remote workers feel isolated, my chamber brain clicks on and says, chambers could think about creating a gathering space for remote workers. Instead of saying, come one, come all, saying, we're having a mixer, a gathering a breakfast just for remote workers and I bet we don't even know who those people are so I just you know so there are groups chambers of commerce and others that already are in that business of gathering people there's another idea so great other thoughts yeah and then Tim uh, the model you talked about about bringing college graduates in and, and um, you know hand holding them or ushering them down a pathway whatever you want to call it the problem is, well, you have a trapped audience, right? You have the college graduates. Once again, we have a whole group of individuals that are not those college graduates that we don't know where they are and we don't know where they went. And they need that same type of setting yep. to be able to call them into one place. I'm sure Monica Green will tell you she doesn't necessarily need that college graduate out on her production line. Right. She needs talented, skilled people that are willing to work and, and all those things. So. Right, I saw, as I was driving into town, I saw Perigo is hiring, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. say, probably the same, same boat. Yes, they're hiring. Who, where, yeah. Um, so how do, so. <laughs> um, We've never done a good job. We've known for how many years, I was in the legislature 12 years ago, we knew then we weren't keeping track of where our students are going, <clears throat> when they're coming back, how we can support them. So in my view, it, you know, short of GPSing everybody when they graduate, right, which is a joke, okay, just so all of you people who, who just got, thought I was really creepy, I just want you to know. Uh, that's, a, that's a joke. But short of doing that, there is technology today to be able to do this. And, you know, as one who keeps a database of all the business people in Vermont, y'all move around a lot and you move from job to job and your email addresses change. I get it. It's, it's a huge undertaking. And I can imagine doing that. But the technology does exist. There are databases for these kinds of things. You hire people to keep that up. And you're not, there's going to always be some amount of people who you don't know where they are. But we could do a better job. Yes. Well, actually, we could do it a bad job, and it would be better than what we're doing, because we're not doing it at all today. So data collection on our high school graduates and our college graduates should be on the list of things to do. Because at a bare minimum, my two kids, early 20s, they're out in the world, no desire to come back for, to Vermont for now. Maybe, I'll get lucky in the future. Um, I know where they are. You could load them in. I could load them in. They're not loaded in anywhere. Nobody knows where they are. They barely know what year they graduated from high school in Vermont. They don't know what college they went to because nobody asked them. Like, like the year that they graduated, it was probably in the high school graduation pamphlet. Like, not that where exactly they're going, but the, nobody's collecting that data everywhere. We have Facebook now. We have all sorts of ways to reach out to these people, and we just don't. Okay, well, that's, we're, we're probably not going to put that idea up here, but yeah. Tim, you had an idea, and then I'll come back to you. Thanks, Betsy. I, I think everything we've talked about is how do we attract people. I think 
I think we have elements within the workforce right here in the state that we should focus on as well. Okay. Uh, I think the benefit split is an issue. Yep. I think uh, most high schools don't have a career center. Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, yeah, really. I was actually going to. I, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> I thought they all had a career center. If you look at a high school student, what am I going to do? If they don't know what's available to them, the choice may be to leave, out, leave the state or join the military or, or something of that nature if they're not going on college. So I think there's a need to, and whether it comes down to mandating career centers in high schools, I think that would be huge. If you look at what Kathy's done over the last eight years, educating high school students that have chosen not to go on to college about the opportunities, she's placed well over 500 individuals. In the That's world. incredible. With that, she's rewarded with $7,500 stipend from the state of Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you. Slow clap. If, if we're serious about this, uh, you know, we've known about this for 10, 10 years or longer sure. that there's going to be a shortfall. And I told, spoke to Kathy Keenan this morning. This is not a priority within the state government. I know. It's a discussion, but it's not a priority. And until we make it a priority and focus on some of these things, whip support, career centers, that type of stuff, I, we have the ability, if we do focus on that, to make an impact on the job numbers. Locally, I have a, I'm having a conversation with the port director for the Highgate border crossing this uh, tomorrow, actually. And we're going to have a discussion about what it takes to bring Canadian workers into the local workforce. I'm, 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 from a very selfish perspective, we're looking at Franklin County. Of course. As I shared with a lot of people, we've made substantial strides over the last 40 years in this region to the point to where we are now. In the next 10 years, if we don't correct this, we're going to start taking steps backwards and companies who have focused on expanding in Vermont will be pulling their lines out and moving them to places where there's people that make tires. It's no longer about jobs. It's about people. And if we, you know, for, for all my life, I've been like preaching, we need more jobs, job growth. That's where it's at. We need the people to fill the jobs or those jobs will go away because People will have to make other decisions. They will grow their small site that's somewhere else. They'll grow that a little larger because it's easier to find employees there. Those are not decisions we want to make. They'll figure out how to automate. I mean, how many of you pump your own gas? Oh, wait, we all do, right? I don't know, looking at the age of the room, maybe not all of us remember, but when I first learned how to drive, I could just drive up to the gas station and somebody else would do that for really? me. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> you and I'll talk after this. Um, how many of you go to a teller anymore? Do you take your paycheck, your paper paycheck, sign the back and go to a teller and get it cash? Do you do that? No, of course not. So you think about all these automation. Anybody feeling very comfortable taking their huge shopping cart of groceries and checking it out yourself and typing in the four-digit code for your groceries? I'm doing it now with like four or five items. I'm not quite there with the whole basket, right? But I'm telling you, they're training me. I'm becoming a really good grocery cashier, right? Like 10 years from now, I'll take that big old grocery thing and I'll scan them and I'll know the Apple code and whatever and there'll only be, there'll only be one of them there. Pardon? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Even better. They're going to make it easier for me. But my point is that we talk about the skills gap, right? We talk about needing skilled employees. We talk about training those employees. We talk about bringing more workers in. And un unfortunately, whether we like it or not, we still need the cashier. We still need the, the clerk at the Dollar General store. We still need those entry-level jobs for those people who don't have experience. And that's part of the ladder. And we don't want to talk about that ladder. We want to talk about the skills, and we want to talk about the higher-paying jobs and that. But it is a ladder, and the idea is to get people in and up. After time, you get to know one another, and you say hi, and ask about each other's lives, and so forth. Young people, what do you plan to do? Yep. Etc. So I think cashiers are really an important part of our, our way of life. Uh, in that, 
they are connecting us to one another. And it's unlikely we're going to do a big marketing campaign for cashiers. I totally get that. But we, we have to recognize that they're part of the economy. Yeah. We were talking a little bit about other people, sort of how do we help remote workers here, but I'm wondering how we, is there, are there ways for some businesses to look at um, their workforce, and maybe there's some people that material handling cannot be remote, right? <laughs> so, but it, are there positions that can be remote, and can we market those collectively um, out of state um, for talent, but also, I mean, I think even though we have a low um, unemployment rate, people with disabilities are higher proportionate. Um, in terms of being unemployed. And so maybe there are ways that we have a database of remote type work or work that's flexible with regulations. You have a mature worker, you have workers with disabilities, you have workers from out of state, um, and collectively we could sort of market that um, in a website or a portal. So it's interesting on the mature worker, at one place somebody coined the term, um, we should market to corporate refugees, which are that mature worker who might be 50 plus who's tired of the rat race in New York City, then wants to get away from that corporate structure, but still wants to work. So there's all sorts of things around that. Yes? One of the other targets, retired uh, people are leaving Vermont. And they're not all people who are totally retired and not working any longer. There's a large group that get down in their late 50s who are going to get a retirement from their company that they were at for a long time, but still want to work, but they're leaving. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are leaving, and um, I'm kind of in that group, and they're, they're leaving because they can't afford to live here. Their retirement is taxed, <coughs> they get the Social Security, that's taxed, the property taxes are high. So when you put that all together, they're still going to work. They still want to work. They would, and they even are interested in those jobs that some of the youth don't want anymore, such as the cashier. Right. But they can't afford to live here, and they're, they're leaving. So what are, if we say that we have an older um, population here, but there's a lot that are leaving. They're leaving to the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. They're leaving to the states that don't tax everything that they've got coming in so, so they can afford to live there. So, yeah. so I, I think it's back, back to that tax policy that we started with. So the mature worker, keeping that 50 plus worker working long, they're already here, keeping them work or lo working longer than we, you know, what can we do in our workplaces to, to keep that worker. So that's good. Somebody else had their... Best places to retire this. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. For quality of life, but not for any of the reasons why. It's primarily the, the tax issues. Yeah. Because I, actually, I moved up here to take a job from South Carolina, and I still have my South Carolina tags on my car, <laughs> and I cannot even tell you how many months. people told me I'm moving yeah. to South Carolina. Where do you Where do you live down there? <laughs> So the important question is Gamecocks or, or Clemson? Clemson. <laughs> Where's Dave Southwick? <laughs> I'm, I'm a Gamecocks fan. The, the other thing is, is we have to capitalize as well on all of those other demographics, you know. We have, I work with both Rehab and Vaber and CWS on a regular basis of people that are very capable. They have barriers, but there's, there's it's, some of those barriers should not prevent them from being in, in the workplace. And the same with, with the second chance individuals. If we think we're not going to solve this issue by looking at that population, we're wrong. Right. And we, we have to um, help employers to understand on that issue as well and capitalize at least on the people we have here. Yep. There's a really good uh, program going on at TwinCraft, which is a yes. soap manufacturer in Winooski, um, where they ta uh, work with the incarcerated population. So when they come out, they're talking to that second chance population, and they've developed a structure around that so that there's a successful transition from being incarcerated into being in the workforce. Um, I, I'm sure there are other examples. That one just stands out for me. So um, any of these target populations, we've talked about tourists, we've talked about sort of that mature worker, the baby boomer population, we've talked about remote workers. Ashley, where else, what else are the, 
the young families. And the young families population. So any other target markets that we should be, yeah? Students. I graduated from St. Mike's two years ago, and I'm one of the only people of my large friend group that stayed in Vermont, despite a desire to stay here, but they couldn't find entry-level jobs in the liberal arts field. They felt like they had to get a master's or a PhD to be able to work here, or they went to Boston or an urban area to find a job in the liberal arts field. Yep. Fields. So good. So the, the, in case you didn't hear that, liberal arts graduates. How do we, they're here, we're producing them from many of our colleges, and this is the woman that I mentioned earlier that came up to me at the end and said, well, you clearly don't need me. Those are your friends. <laughs> she had a four-year liberal arts degree, and her answer was, well, nobody's pounding on my door, so I'm going to go back to school. One. And you were determined because you wanted to stay here, so thank you. But not everybody wants to go through that kind of effort just to get their first job, right? So uh, um, I had that same experience 100 years ago when I graduated from college. And uh, I went to China for my first job, so go figure. Um, lived there for a while. <laughs> Another group are parents wanting to return to the workforce. They've been out of work for quite a long time. And working at the Northwest Technical Center, all technical centers, for those of you who don't know, we are required to offer adult training for continuing education. That's why I'm very fortunate to work alongside Country Roy because we partner in delivering training. And many times we receive phone calls from moms or dads wanting to return to the workforce. They don't know where to start, and if they have started with the interview process, they're typically overlooked for the younger person, and that younger person ha will more than likely have a history of hopping from job to job to job. But if you look at that 45-year-old woman or man, or 50-year-old woman or man, they may be the best worker that you can hire. So that's a population that I see. What can we do to help them? What can we do to fix that? When, when I, as an employer, look at that resume and go, kind of light, they're going over in that pile. And when I look at the resume of the young worker that's hopped from job to job to job, I go, well, at least they've had some jobs, and I'm putting them in the maybe pile. How do we get that resume? Because I do this. I'm doing this right now. I do this regularly. I get 100 resumes, and I got to weed them out somehow. Yeah. There's an employer education component of that. There's an employer education for all of these populations, whether it's people with barriers who are coming out of, you know, and who need second chances, or, um, you know, old people who are older and haven't worked for a while that um, some employers don't recognize the cost benefit of, you know, for people who are recovering, who are in recovery, actually make some of the best employees because they are <coughs> determined to stay sober. Yep. And employers don't think of it that way. Yes, um, they just want somebody to show up and work for eight hours and they, well, yes. For that parent transition back in, one of the best resumes I ever saw was years ago from a person very similar to that. It was a, a mom who had been out of the workforce for a while. It was the best resume. She absolutely focused on all the skills that she gained being a parent, like budgeting skills, you know, how to make your dollar go further, and organizational skills, how to how to keep everything flowing in the right direction. So, you know, for adult education, it may be a good opportunity to, to look at those skill sets that they actually gain being a parent to help them to tailor their resume to something that is useful in the workplace. I think sometimes we forget that, you know, being a parent is more than just taking care of their kids. <laughs> Yes, for those of us who have done that, it is more than that, yeah. So they need new training. And of course, the Department of Labor has, little, has programs for that, but they have to meet the eligibility, and a lot of times people don't. So there has to be some other form of training, whether it is in the employer part or, in, or some type of training that's affordable for people to upgrade their skills so their resume isn't light. Mm -hmm. Maybe light as far as employment because it was a long time. But if you saw, if you took that resume that you set aside and said was light, but you saw 
updated training mm -hmm. on there with that entice the employer to hire them more, um, whether it be computer skills, marketing skills, accounting skills, whatever. But it's expensive to get that training. So yep. question of Tim. Tim. Oh. <laughs> if the veggie program what? The veggie program. Yeah. Commerce. Yeah. What about it? Did you know the rules would allow them to talk to employers with their funding training to look at certain populations? Oh, I, <laughs> the veggie program has uh, had lots of. Uh, um, mandates put on what they can do. So sure, that can, that can happen. Uh, the problem, my, my, my flippancy about that is that um, very few people are taking advantage of it now, putting up more obstacles and more little, little narrow things that you've got to do as an employer isn't going to help that situation. But, um, get rid of the but-for. Get rid of the but-for. That's on the job piece of it, so yes, but uh, yeah. And it's interesting, the economy right now is uh, really good for folks with disabilities in terms of finding employment. And I echo what folks have said about that, you know, that that particular group of folks can do the work, they're, they've got the skills. I was going to say that we have funding for training and we partner with Sally and the Department of Labor quite a bit and, and work with Kathy and the rest. And uh, our own numbers, if we help folks with what we call short-term training, some kind of training that leads to some type of credential for folks. Yeah. So that they're 24, 20 percent more likely to end up in paid employment for us, and they're also more likely to end up at a wage that's higher than you know, other folks yes. that we place that don't have. Yeah. It's kind of a no-brainer if people, you know, get the skills that the workforce is looking for. <laughs> They're going to get hired, and they're going to get hired at a higher wage. And I think that's that's the talent pipeline management yeah. process that you're working on. Is what are those? So, so you you had talked about the construction industry, and specifically working with the employers of that, and saying, what do you need? Yeah. What's important to you? What what certification is important to you? And then working with you to make sure that those people are getting that, so that they get that. So when it arrives at the employer, it's you're giving the employer what they need, as opposed to sometimes what happens is we train people and they still aren't suited for the job that's available. And that, that's a waste of money for the employer, maybe not for the, the person, but if they aren't getting a job, we're not training them for the right thing. Yeah? I think Vermont has some of the best services in our country to support all kinds of folks into getting employment. Um, I don't, oh, I don't think that's an issue here in our state. I really do. I'm, I'm biased. I've worked in that field for years. Um, I work at the local high school, and I've been there for over 20 years. And when I started, there were over 1,200 students in our high school. There are 850 in our high school now. So it's a larger, yes, we need to look at all these other incentives and ways to help our current population. But we have to figure out ways to make it attractive for more people to live here. So I know, I know that. That's, that's the, the whole point. point. Yes. Is, I, I just felt well, I wanted to bring the conversation back to get so, more people into our state. So, and this is this is the problem. There, there are we we can't stop training the people who are here and getting them today. We have to do that. So keep going, keep going, keep going. But at the same time, we've never had any focus that I am aware of, and I've been all over the state talking about this, on this problem, of getting more people here. And we need to get them here, and then get them trained and put in the right jobs too. So it's not like we're all out just recruiting more engineers. We need more. Yeah? Um, it's interesting you say that, because I'm sitting here thinking um, our history at Vermont Precision Tools has been um, recruitment and retention kind of separate. And when we compare the columns of what those needs are, they're actually quite similar. So I hear what you're saying in terms of um, how do we get them to, you know, to stay um, and to advance and to, to start their families. Um, and I think um, it's not that dissimilar for the, the 20 somethings um, and, the, and the young families starting. They want the same thing. They want a, a job that allows them to have the house, you know, the two children, um, have disposable income, 
And I know for us as an employer, we've been through you know, the training gaps and we've created um, or worked with partners in the community to fill that void for us because we have, we're larger than average. So I'm trying to also figure out how this works for a 15 man shop right. than compared to um, a 200 person uh, facility. But the bottom line is <clears throat> when we look at what they're looking for, they have to have all of the, the healthcare, a decent pay, the PTO. But they also want home ownership. And I know that, you know, sort of an enlightenment that we had is like, we've got this great retirement plan. And we're a 24 year old thinking, that's great. But I kind of want a house. I want to be able to, you know, start a family. Yeah. That's in my, in my yeah. immediate future. And I have no way of raising $20,000 for my down payment on my house. And I want what I understood to be the Burlington, and now St. Albans is also, in my mind, that destination city that we can say, look, we've got the recreation, we've got the shops, we've got the restaurants, and we've got Swanton affordability. So can we make that work? But again, the, the person making $18 an hour or $25 an hour is still going to struggle to buy the home and commit to staying long term. Right. Somebody who is in an apartment is not committed in my mind and are going to New York um, to rent um, or to Bakersfield or areas outside of it and then they get frustrated and say well, I can't make a living here and I don't want to commute or whatever um, and it's not a, a long term commitment. So it's interesting Monica that the, the housing piece and the affordability piece that was mentioned earlier are often talked about and we can there's a whole whole bunch of things going on with housing that are good and we need to do that too. Um, but I've never actually heard it put in the way that you just put it, which is <laughs> in addition to getting them here and making sure that they have a decent wage and decent benefits, the way you root them here, there's a couple ways. Like if they have family here, if I, you have family here, you're rooted here, that's one way of sticking. So you might have an apartment, but you're rooted here. But home ownership, as a route. Um, I've never really thought about it in that direction. So that's very interesting. So in, in addition to attracting an employer. The person that you speak about is, that may want to raise their family in a town like Swanton, um, they still have to figure out how to get the down payment and, and how to do that. So there is an affordability. Somebody who is just out of college is not ready to go buy a house. They're going to get an apartment and figure out where it is they want to mm -hmm. um, live, but also make sure that they have a job that has um, you know years to come and advancement opportunities. But I know for a company like us, we are now having conversations about what kind of program, um, what kind of relationships or networking can we do to bring a down payment possibility to the 25 year old, well, 30 year old that we're I love it. I, I love you have a major employer in your region talking about how to recruit and retain employers through something that's not a very traditional benefit. Similar to the conversation about can we make <coughs> reimbursement of college loans a, a benefit of employment. Your employers are bringing innovation to this as opposed to going to the state and saying give me money which leads to higher taxes. You're, you're, I'm, I'm in my little business thinking about can I offer more than one thing 401k, you choose, you employee choose. Do you want the 401k or do you want the uh, college reimbursement or the home? I, like, as a small employer, I can't do all of those things. Pick two out of three or so. Everybody gets health care, but you know, something like that. So it's fascinating to hear you, you, you talk about that. Yeah. I think the other piece that um, comes up in these conversations is transportation. And so, um, the, you know, there are some employers that run sort of shuttles um, back and forth between Chittenden and Franklin County, um, both of which I've worked in, so it's interesting for me to see the differences. And even between St. Albans and Swanton, trying to get, trying to get a, a potential employer to um, run precision tools from St. Albans who doesn't have a car um, mm -hmm. for second or third shift is right. possible. Right, and the problem with that is we, you know, everybody wants mass transit, but we really don't have mass right. to transit. Right. 
I mean, if you've lived in Boston, right? It's a vastly different yeah, problem. I get that much support. You know, I mean, that's one of my favorite rants, and I've talked to so many people in the legislature and in, in you know, transportation, which is really in this area only the Burlington uh, company, and they don't seem too invested in even having you know, one extra run to Richford and Unisburg during the day, um, even if it's a minivan or something like that. But um, if, you know, it's putting a lot on the employers, again, to ask them to have shuttles. But that yes. would be, no. But that I'd be rather see the employer decide to do that themselves than the state yeah. mandate the employer do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to take uh, one two, three, four more questions, and then we're going to try to wrap up. Go ahead. One of the other bottlenecks, I think, is the financing for entrepreneurs in order to start the business that will provide the jobs. Just a case in point, um, a year ago, I opened up the Vermont Salt Lake Spa in Montgomery Center. We did three different banks, all of whom have had traditions for many years and have mortgages with and everything else. I was turned down by all of them because it was something that was a little bit different. <laughs> um, Eventually, it was through Community Capital, which is a state-funded yep. source. Of, uh, yep. They gave me uh, some money and took the risk, and this all worked out. But that's something. How does somebody go to get money to start a business to? And I think that alternative financing exactly where, you know, with community capital is exactly why the state is funding that. So let's Job make sure. And, and Jobstart, um, SBDC, those, those types of efforts are there. Yeah. Yes? There are other models of other states that have successfully done this. It's a great question. Now that I've been like on this this mode, there's some really cool stuff happening. Wall Street Journal had an article about Maine and how they've gotten together a group of techies who are combing the internet. And I don't mean they're personally doing it. They're creating tech spiders to go out to find anybody who has Maine in their LinkedIn profiles and then offering up job opportunities to them. Very cool. We could do the same thing very easily because we're looking for Vermont. We're not looking for Maine. Um, I was uh, in my Facebook feed the other day. Must be something I looked at before because they offered me up a, uh, a video of this very small town in Kansas. I can't remember the name of the town that has decided to offer um, tuition reimburse, uh, tuition payments if you decide to live and uh, live there. You can work wherever you'd like, but if you lived there for some period of time, and just looking at the comments of that, and how many people were like, I would do this, I would move to Kansas, I would, other people were saying Kansas. But, but so there are some very cool examples out there. So yeah, yeah, you had, did you have one? Oh, sorry, go ahead, and then you, yeah. Two young children here. I think one thing that we're missing is how do you sell the, the community and looking at the family the family holistically about what the benefits are. When I think about if I have a well-paying job, I want to buy a house. I also want my kids to have a good education. And so, what are we doing to promote what we can do within our local schools so that we can promote that? Well, you might be taking a slight pay cut. You might not be getting the things that you're looking for. Your children are going to have these benefits, and that also ties into the child care yep. piece of how are we selling the piece of the community connectedness, and what does your community have to offer? I think that sometimes when we talk about the quality of life, I'm not sure that it's where it used to be or where yeah. we hope that it is. I think sometimes that has changed, and we owe it to ourselves to look at that and to re-examine what things have changed over the last 10 years. I also was a UVM graduate, and I chose to stay here. I was not born and raised here. And just in my time here, things have changed. And so I think we need to spend some time looking at that. It also makes me think about with the graduates that are leaving. I'm wondering what we're doing as universities um, in these towns that the colleges are located in. What are we doing with those students to create that sense of connectedness where they're feeling like they're invested in the community in which they're going to school? Because my guess is that if they're feeling like they're connected to that, it may not be as easy to have root and to be. So sometimes we hear that with internships and um, partnerships with that. So really good observations. Um, and on the quality of life, you're not alone in that. Um, we've, we've heard that uh, from a number of folks. 
more from a people who um, maybe weren't born and raised here, okay? Um, that quality of life to some people who are moving here means something different. So, you know, I look at Target coming to Vermont and there's a whole group of people who are like, ah, oh, Target's coming to Vermont. And a whole other group of people are like, Target's coming to Vermont. That can be a quality of life issue. I'm just picking on that particular thing, but people see that differently. And we have to respect that and reevaluate what it is we want. And I think there's enough that, that we can do that. But saying more than quality of life and figuring out what our community is, I, I love that. I, I love that. And then you had something. Yes, yeah, so with the Department of Labor, I work with employers. And a lot of times we go out and we talk to them about ways to help recruit and so forth. And one of the things that especially talking about twin craft and they've done something pretty innovative which is working with the new Americans and they now have in fact not just even twin craft they have uh, started to conduct uh, English classes on site so that they can help these people stay employed and learn and be able to uh, you know progress through the mm -hmm. you know, through the uh, chain of going you know, increasing you know, their wages and so sure. forth. But regarding transportation, I've also talked to some of the employers, and something as simple as giving a plus pass or as a new hire sort of benefit so they are able to get to work for the first month until they get their first paycheck. And something as simple as that is, you know, help them get Great. back to work. Good ideas. Okay, so let's try to pull this together a little bit. And um, I, <laughs> this is what's so invigorating about doing this is lots of ideas. Um, a lot of these end up in a place that I believe says, well, we need to, at, at the bare minimum, tell somebody that we want them here. And that can be some kind of a marketing campaign, but it doesn't have to be. It can be sort of that tourism ambassador piece that, that we talked about. Um, in 2015, the Vermont Chamber started this effort. And we went to, at that time, the Shumlin administration and said, we need to tell people that we want them here. Um, and to uh, Governor Shumlin's credit, and then the legislature responded, we got an initial $200,000, not we, the Vermont Chamber, but the state, to create a, the first marketing plan for economic development, for telling people that we want them here and telling businesses that we want them here. So that plan has been done. Last year, we went to the Scott administration and the subsequently to the legislature and we said, okay, we got this plan, we spent money on it, let's move it forward. So we secured $250,000 to begin that plan. The first $250,000 is not a lot of money when you're trying to market to all of these populations to tell them to come here. But we have to take our successes in small, I'm not sure we're ready for doing all of these things, but we're getting there. And that $250,000, uh, what you will see is the thinkvermont.com website has been redone to uh, really think about um, how we get people and jobs here. So we will be going to the legislature and asking for that next slog of money. Representative Keenan, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, she is on the House Appropriations Committee, somebody that we work with in, these, in this area and has been a huge advocate for this. Um, and sometimes not always um, supported by the rest of your committee. Uh, so she's fighting the good fight and uh, we will continue to do that. And it, it, it cannot be at the expense of robbing the tourism marketing to do this marketing. It has to be in addition. But partly what needs to come next is who do we target? We just can't say come to Vermont. We have to think about this. So our plan with all of this information, what we do with this is we write this whole thing up. Uh, we're giving it to the Vermont Futures Project. And on the Vermont Futures Project website, which if you're interested, they have their website on this card. There is, uh, the, it says on the homepage, uh, workshop forums. Workforce Solution Forums. And when you click on that, you get a region by region synopsis of this. So this will take, I don't know, a couple of days to put up. But we summarize all of your comments on the post-it notes. We put all your solutions into an area. And if you're interested, you can see what happened when we went to Mad River, what they said about these same conversations in Bennington. 
Um, when we went to Burlington, what was said. When we went to Rutland, what was said. And we're going all around the state. And then the final synopsis of that will be a summary of the whole state and a funnel. So if you're interested in staying engaged in this topic, please leave your card off with me. Just give us your email address in some way, and we'll get this information back out to you. Um, and thank you for your time and your energy and your input. Uh, this has been great, really invigorating. Thank you.